Welcome to the lectures for Basics of Biblical Hebrew, Chapter 9, the chapter on pronominal suffixes. Now, back in Chapter 8, we studied a certain set of pronouns known as the independent personal pronouns. And one of the things you learned about the independent personal pronouns is that those pronouns were subject pronouns. They always functioned as the subject of a verbless clause or the subject of a verb. In this chapter, we're going to cover pronominal suffixes. Two things to know about pronominal suffixes. Number one, pronominal suffixes always appear attached to the end of something. That's why they call them pronominal suffixes. They appear as suffixes on the end of words. Number two, these pronouns are not subject pronouns. They function either as the object of a verb or they show possession with nouns. They function either as the object of verbs or they'll show possession with nouns. They'll also appear in prepositional phrases as the object of a preposition. So in this category, the pronominal suffixes will be dealing with suffixes with objective and possessive translation values. Before we begin looking at the pronominal suffixes, let's study a few things about the grammar of the pronominal suffixes. Look with me at your screen. Number one, pronominal suffixes are pronouns that are suffixed to nouns, prepositions, the definite direct object marker, and verbs. In this chapter, we'll cover the pronominal suffixes attached to nouns, prepositions, and the definite direct object marker. We'll reserve our study of verbs until later, after we've had some verbs. Number two, pronominal suffixes may be either possessive, as in my, your, his, her, our, or their, or objective, me, you, him, her, us, or them. Those are the two basic categories for usage. Number three, when appearing on nouns, pronominal suffixes are possessive, as in his book or her wisdom. When appearing on prepositions or the definite direct object marker, including verbs, but we'll study that later, they are objective, as in to them or for them or simply them. Number four, all pronominal suffixes have person, gender, and number. In terms of person, they can be first, second, or third person. In terms of gender, masculine, feminine, or common. And in terms of number, singular or plural. So remember, all pronouns have person, gender, and number. Our fifth point, let's look at your screen. In Hebrew, there are two sets of pronominal suffixes. There's the type one set and the type two set. The suffixes for each set have the same basic possessive and objective translation values. In general, type one suffixes occur with singular nouns and the definite direct object marker. Type two suffixes occur with plural nouns and prepositions can take either type one or type two pronominal suffixes. Let's look at a couple of examples of how pronominal suffixes are translated when they appear on nouns possessively. Let's look at your screen. When attached to nouns, pronominal suffixes are possessive, as the two examples illustrate on your screen. The first example, susacha. You'll recognize the masculine singular noun sus. In red, you'll see the second person masculine singular pronominal suffix ka, susacha. Because the pronominal suffix appears on a noun, we're going to translate it possessively, your horse. Notice that in Hebrew, horse comes first and the possessive pronoun comes second. But in English, our translation begins with the pronoun your and then finishes with the horse. So you'll have to translate this construction backwards. Begin at the end and finish at the beginning. Let's look at the second example, susacha. Here you have a 2ms pronominal suffix, second masculine singular, appearing on the end of a masculine plural noun, horses. Likewise, the noun is first and the pronoun is second, but we're going to translate it with the pronoun first and the noun second, your horses. Let's look at a second set of examples, but in this instance, the pronouns are not translated possessively, but objectively. Look at your screen with me. Number two, when attached to prepositions, pronominal suffixes are objective, as the two examples below with the Lamed will illustrate. Lecha, and lachem. In each instance, the pronominal suffix is attached to the preposition. And that pronominal suffix, in each case, functions as the object of the preposition. So to you, masculine singular, or to you, masculine plural. 
You've also encountered by now the definite direct object marker. As you know, the definite direct object marker marks objects of verbs that are definite. Objects of verbs that are definite. A pronoun is considered a definite object. A pronoun is considered a definite object. So, pronominal suffixes can appear suffixed to the definite direct object marker. And when that happens, the definite direct object marker is not translated. It just holds the place of or marks the fact that the pronoun is now functioning as the object of the verb. So look at your screen with me, number three. When attached to the definite direct object marker, eighth, also spelled eth, the pronominal suffixes are objective and in each case are translated just by themselves. So otho, the first example, is simply translated him, or otham, masculine plural, them. Later in this lecture, we'll talk about the spelling changes that appear with the definite direct object marker. You'll now see on your screen the two sets of pronominal suffixes, type 1 and type 2. The type 1 pronominal suffixes appear in the left column. The type 2 pronominal suffixes appear in the right column. At a point in this particular lecture, I'll tell you that you'll need to memorize these pronominal suffixes. But it's not very helpful to memorize them just by themselves because it's difficult to pronounce the vowels that appear at the beginning of the type 2 suffixes. Later we'll learn a particular paradigm with a preposition lamed, and I'll show you which paradigm to memorize. In all of this chapter, it's probably best just to memorize one paradigm and then how the pronominal suffixes are attached and work with all the other ones. So we'll focus on that later. But for now, simply take note that type 1 pronominal suffixes and type 2 pronominal suffixes share many things in common. Let's look at the screen together and notice that type 1 and type 2 pronominal suffixes for the most part exhibit the same basic spelling. The fundamental difference between a type 1 suffix and a type 2 suffix is the presence of a yod before the pronominal suffix itself. So you'll notice in all of the type 2 categories a yod is a part of the spelling. And in all the type 1 categories, only the 1CS category has the yod. All of the other categories do not have the yod. That's how you distinguish between the two, but it will become apparent later in terms of how they're attached to the nouns, prepositions, or object marker. In addition to the regular pronominal suffixes in the type 1 category, there are also a set of alternate type 1 suffixes. Look at your screen with me. The alternate type 1 suffixes appear not in every case, but in selected cases the 1CS, 3MS, 3FS, 3MP, and 3FP category. There is some correspondence between the two forms, uh, the presence of a hey, uh, the presence of the wow, the presence of the yod, but you'll want to memorize those forms. At the end of this lecture, I'll show you the chart that summarizes all of these forms together. But for now, I just want to orient you to the fact that you're going to see um, type 1 and type 2, and sometimes in the type 1 category, you'll see slightly different forms and these are the alternate forms. Now we want to take a look with how pronominal suffixes appear with masculine nouns. To do that, we're going to divide it into two. First, we'll look at pronominal suffixes appearing with singular masculine nouns, and then we'll look at pronominal suffixes appearing with plural masculine nouns. So how does a pronominal suffix appear with a masculine singular noun? Let's look together at your screen. You'll see that type 1 suffixes appearing with masculine nouns are in the left category or the left column. In each case, the pronominal suffix is highlighted in red. And in each case, the translation of these pronominal suffixes appearing with nouns are translated possessively. Possessively. Susi, my horse. Susacha, your horse. Suseich, your horse. Suso, his horse, etc. In each case, the pronominal suffix has a distinct form indicating person, gender, and number. Person, gender, and number. And you can see the spelling of the masculine singular noun is stable throughout in this particular case. Let's look at how pronominal suffixes appear with masculine plural nouns. Let's look together at your screen. Susecha, your horses. Susaic, your horses, etc. One of the most important observations to make when looking at how pronominal suffixes appear with masculine plural nouns is this. When a masculine plural noun takes a pronominal suffix, it drops its regular masculine plural inflectional ending and uses type 2 pronominal suffixes. Let me put it this way. If you have a masculine singular noun, sus, 
in the masculine plural, it's susim. When you add a pronominal suffix to susim, you drop the im and you add a type 2 pronominal suffix. So the question will become then, well, if you drop the im, how do you identify the masculine noun as plural? And it's easy. The masculine noun is identified as plural because it uses type 2 suffixes. All right. So a masculine singular noun and a masculine plural noun with a pronominal suffix will look the same in terms of the spelling of the noun itself. It's the suffix that will tell you whether that noun is singular or plural. If the noun is using a type 1 suffix, the noun is singular. If the noun is using a type 2 suffix, the noun is plural. The eem is gone in the masculine plural, and you tell that the noun is plural by the use of type 2 pronominal suffixes. In the paradigms with the type 1 and type 2 pronominal suffixes with masculine nouns, there's one form that may be a little bit tricky, and that's the 1CS, or the first person common singular form. Look at your screen with me. Be careful to note the important difference in spelling between the 1CS type 1 and type 2 suffixes. The type 1 suffix is spelled with hiric yod. The type 2 suffix is spelled with pathic yod. So let's look. Susi, hiric yod, my horse. The noun is singular. Example 2, susai, with the pathic, my horses. Notice that the noun is sus in each case, but the spelling of the 1CS pronominal suffix is slightly different. In the type 1 singular, susi, in the type 2 plural, susai. The change in vowel from hiric to pathic indicates a change in the number of the verb, singular or plural. That's a very slight change for English readers to pick up on this, but it's a very important change to notice the difference between a singular and a plural noun. Let's now look at how pronominal suffixes are added to feminine nouns, both singular and plural. Remember, as with all nouns, singular nouns appear with type 1 pronominal suffixes and plural nouns appear with type 2 pronominal suffixes. Our noun that we're going to use for the example is the feminine singular noun Torah, meaning law or instruction. Look at the paradigm on your left, the single paradigm with type 1 pronominal suffixes. Torathi, my law. Torathicha, your law. Torathaik, your law. Toratho, his law. One of the spelling changes that you've probably already identified is the fact that the hay in Torah at the end has changed. The hay is changed to a tau. Now you know already that the consonant hay is very weak. And if you're ever going to add anything to a word that ends in a hay, the hay will either drop off or change. And in this case, the hay strengthens to tau. Let me demonstrate what happens on my screen here. I'm going to begin by writing out the Hebrew word Torah. This feminine singular word ends in comets hay. Now you know, as I've just told you, whenever a feminine word ends in a hay, and you want to add something to the ending of it, the hay will either drop off or in this case strengthen. When you have a hay strengthening or changing, it's going to strengthen or change to the tau. Hay will strengthen to tau or change to tau. Now you know from our discussion of nouns in chapter 4 that hay and tau mark the feminine singular gender. They're both feminine consonants. When a Hebrew noun that's feminine in an incomet's hay wants to strengthen itself, it's going to strengthen to tau. So let's do it. We're now going to strengthen our hay to tau. Once we've strengthened our hay to tau, we are free to add anything we want to the end. So now we can add, for example, our hiric yod for the 1cs pronominal suffix, meaning my law. Let's look at the feminine plural category together. In the feminine plural category, we're going to use type 2 suffixes because all plural nouns use type 2 suffixes. Let's look. The first example in the 1CS category, Torothi, my laws. Torothecha, your laws. Torothayach, your laws again. Or Torothau, his laws. What you'll notice here that's important is that with feminine plural nouns, the strong feminine plural ending, holom wow tau, is preserved in every case. Now with masculine plural nouns, the masculine plural ending dropped off. But with feminine plural nouns, 
the feminine plural ending is preserved. So you can identify a feminine plural noun with a pronominal suffix as plural in two ways. Number one, it has the feminine plural ending, holum wow tau. And number two, it also uses type two pronominal suffixes. Now, so how do, we, how do we work this all together? Watch. In the masculine category, masculine singular nouns don't change. You simply add type one pronominal suffixes to them. In the masculine plural category, you drop the masculine plural inflectional ending and you add the type two suffixes. With feminine nouns in the singular, you strengthen the he to tau and you add a type one suffix. With feminine plural nouns, you maintain the inflectional ending, holum wow tau, and you add the type two pronominal suffixes. So you must keep in your mind the slight and important morphological changes. Remember this, masculine plural nouns, drop inflectional ending, add type two suffixes. Feminine singular nouns, strengthen the he to tau, add type one suffixes. Feminine plural nouns, maintain the inflectional endings, add type two nouns. Now this may seem complicated, but there's really only three changes that you need to be aware of to master how nouns will change when you add pronominal suffixes to them. Now you already know, whenever you add something to the end of a noun, you're going to change the accent and syllable structure of that noun. And when you change the accent or syllable structure of a noun, you're going to see, perhaps in many instances, slight changes in vocalization. That is, some of the vowels in the noun are going to shift. Now you've seen all of those types of changes before in our discussion of nouns and adjectives. You'll see propretonic reduction. You'll see application of the rule of Schwa, both one and two, and other such changes. Those same changes also occur in nouns when you add pronominal suffixes because you're changing the accent and syllable structure. Look with me here on your screen. You'll see just a few examples of nouns that change their vocalization when you add a pronominal suffix. However, these types of changes you've already seen. And so there's no real need to go over them. I just want to make you aware of the fact that you will see changes in vocalization, the spelling of the vowels, when you add pronominal suffixes. But again, let me emphasize this. You've already encountered those types of changes. You're not learning anything new. You're just seeing something you already know applied to a slightly different context, reinforcing what you know and growing your knowledge of it. Now, certain nouns require special attention when it comes to how they appear with pronominal suffixes. The first type of noun that requires special attention are monosyllabic nouns. Monosyllabic nouns. Now, not all monosyllabic nouns, but I just want to comment on certain singular monosyllabic nouns. In Hebrew, there are a couple of nouns that are super common. And remember, that which is most common is also most irregular. And these are two of those super common words that are going to be super irregular. In Hebrew, certain monosyllabic nouns add hiric yod to their stem before pronominal suffix. Let me say that again. In Hebrew, certain monosyllabic nouns like av, father, and ach, brother, will add hiric yod to their stem before the addition of pronominal suffixes. And this occurs only in the singular. Let's look together at your screen. Here you'll see the monosyllabic noun ach, meaning brother. Notice in the type one category or the singular category, a hiric yod appears after the noun ach in every form. That hiric yod is actually something very old. Now you don't need to memorize this and you don't need to certainly know this to make sense of it, but that hiric yod is actually the old genitive case marker in Hebrew. A long time before classical biblical Hebrew, what we know and have in our Bible, Hebrew used a system of cases like Greek uses a system of cases to demonstrate the function of the noun. The genitive case was marked with the hiric yod in Hebrew. Now that system fell out. However, sometimes it reappears with, with really common nouns because that which is most common is most irregular and so these common nouns preserve the older forms that now appear irregular to us. All right. Now you don't have to memorize any of that. It's just perhaps helpful background if you like to know the why of what's going on. All right. Now look at the screen with me again. In the type one category, you will see following the noun ach is the hiric yod. You can think of it almost like a connecting vowel. All right. Now in each instance, that hiric yod is going to appear between the noun and the pronominal suffix. The only exception is the 1CS category where the pronominal suffix itself is hiric yod 
And you can't add hirik yod to hirik yod because that's a vowel added to a vowel, and Hebrew doesn't permit two vowels in a row. Now let's look at the second column, the type 2 category, with the plural noun. You'll notice that in this category, there's also a yod between the noun ach and the pronominal suffix, but it's never hirik yod, ever. Okay? So the pronominal suffixes on this particular noun can be slightly confusing because both the type 1 and the type 2 forms appear with a yod. You must, mem you must remember this distinction. In the singular category, it's always hirik yod. In the plural category, it's never hirik yod. Next, we want to talk about prepositions with pronominal suffixes. Now, one of the things you know about prepositions is that they don't have number. You don't have a singular preposition or a plural preposition. You just have a preposition. And prepositions can take either type 1 or type 2 pronominal suffixes. Now, you don't have to memorize which prepositions take type 1 pronominal suffixes and which prepositions take type 2 pronominal suffixes. Why? Because both type 1 and type 2 suffixes have the same translation value. Just know this. When a preposition appears with a pronominal suffix, the preposition is translated objectively. Objectively. All right? So in the two examples on your screen, in number two, you'll see the preposition lamed with the 2ms pronominal suffix cha, lacha, translated to you. The preposition lamed happens to take a type 1 pronominal suffix. Good. Look at the second example. Alecha. Alecha, on you. You'll notice that the preposition al takes type 2 pronominal suffixes. Why? Well, there's no real reason. The preposition lamed prefers type 1. The preposition al prefers type 2. Whether you use type 1 or type 2, it's the same translation value. Now look at your screen with me, and we'll see the full paradigm for the preposition lamed and the preposition al. The preposition lamed takes type 1 pronominal suffixes, and the preposition al takes type 2 pronominal suffixes. Very clear. Now, here's the thing. Remember earlier I told you that pronominal suffixes will need to be memorized, but you don't want to memorize them by themselves. These two paradigms are the paradigms to memorize if you want to master pronominal suffixes. Let's look at the screen together. In the left-hand column, you'll see type 1 pronominal suffixes appearing with the lamed preposition. Let's say these forms together because you're going to want to memorize the construction of the preposition lamed with the type 1 pronominal suffixes, and this will be the way you memorize the pronominal suffix paradigm. We'll begin with the 1CS singular and continue all the way through the 3FP plural. We won't read the English translations because our focus will be on the pronunciation of the prepositional phrase constructions. Let's begin. Li, lecha, lach. Lo, la, lanu, lachem, lachen, lahem, lahen. There are a couple of things I want to point out in this particular paradigm. Number one, in the 3FS, in the 3FS category, the 3FS pronominal suffix is spelled comets with a hay and a dot in that hay. Now, you've been told that a doggish forte cannot appear in a guttural. You should also know that you'll never have a consonant at the end of a word with a doggish forte. Well, this is not a doggish forte. Sometimes the consonant he can strengthen itself. You already know that the consonant he is weak. Whenever you see the consonant he at the end of a word and it's got a dot in it, the mapik, that's what the dot is called, the mapik strengthens the consonant he, and it gives a little more emphasis to the pronunciation. So instead of something like la, it'd be more like la, and you'd emphasize the h sound at the end. However, when you're speaking, the distinction is really lost. But you just simply want to know that that, that dot in the he is a mapik, not a doggish forte. Okay, now, let's look at the screen again together. Once again, the paradigm with the preposition lamed is the paradigm you want to memorize. Now, some people may require the memorization of the second paradigm, the preposition al, with the type 2 pronominal suffix. 
However, it's not entirely necessary to memorize the second paradigm. Why? If you'll look, the fundamental consonantal spelling of each pronominal suffix is the same in the type 1 and the type 2 category. The difference is really the addition of yod in the type 2 category. So if you don't like paradigm memorization or if paradigm memorization is not that helpful to you, then I would say memorize only one paradigm, the preposition lamed with the pronominal suffix. If, however, you struggle to distinguish between the type 1 and the type 2 pronominal suffixes, memorize both paradigms. Memorize both paradigms. However, I found in my own experience and with my own students, the memorization of the preposition lamed with the type 1 suffixes will suffice for the proper identification of pronominal suffixes. A couple of more items. Let's look at your screen together. There are two particular prepositions that require special attention when it comes to their ability to take pronominal suffixes. The preposition cough and the preposition min. Let's look at the preposition cough together. You will immediately see in the singular category of the preposition cough all the way down through the 1CP form, so the 1CS through the 1CP, that there's an alternate spelling of the preposition cough, and that is camo, camo. You can think of the preposition cough having two forms, a short form, the k sound, and a long form, the camo sound. When the preposition cough takes a pronominal suffix in the singular and 1CP category, it will always be spelled with the longer form, camo. Then when you get to the 2MP and following, the last four forms in the paradigm, you will see that it reverts to the regular spelling of the preposition with the single cough. That's an important feature to know about. Look at the second paradigm with me that identifies the spelling of the preposition min. Likewise, the preposition min is spelled in a longer fashion. You can even think about, about it being doubled. It's not just min, but it's mim, mim, with a doggish forte in the second mim. All right? That longer spelling in the 1CS through the 1CP occurs consistently in those categories. But in the forms below the 2MP through the 3FP, the last four forms in the paradigm, it's spelled as if it is inseparably prefixed to the preposition with the assimilated noun entering into the first consonant of the pronominal suffix. In the 2MP and 2FP categories, the noun is assimilated as a doggish forte. In the 3MP and 3FP categories, the assimilated noun tries to go into the hay as a doggish forte. The hay is a guttural, the guttural rejects the doggish forte, and you get compensatory lengthening. So the spelling of the last four forms should make sense to you with what you already know. The important thing to realize is that the preposition cough and the preposition min have two distinct sets of spellings. There are the upper spellings that occur mostly with the singular forms, the longer spellings, and then the shorter spellings. On your vocabulary cards, you may want to indicate the longer spelling so that you associate the two together always. Now, in addition to nouns and prepositions, pronominal suffixes can also appear on the definite direct object marker. Now you know that the definite direct object marker marks the definite direct object of a verbal clause. Good. A pronoun is considered definite, and so a pronominal suffix can appear on the end of a definite direct object marker as the definite direct object of a verb. Let's look at our screen together. The object marker, or the definite direct object marker, eth, also spelled eth, will take type 1 pronominal suffixes. It's always translated as a personal pronoun in the objective, or what some might call the accusative case. Let's look at our example together on the screen. Here we have the verb zakar, which means he remembered. Zakar otham. Zakar otham. He remembered them. In this example, you see the verb followed by the definite direct object marker, and on the definite direct object marker is the 3MP pronominal suffix om. This suffix is translated as them objectively. The definite direct object marker, you know, is never translated. It simply marks a grammatical slot, the objective or accusative slot. All right, now let's continue and look at our next screen together. Here I want to point out to you the spelling of the definite direct object marker with pronominal suffixes and the spelling of the preposition eth or eth 
with the pronominal suffix. You will know that in terms of their lexical forms, the definite direct object marker and the preposition are spelled identically. It's both eighth or alternatively eth. However, when these two words take pronominal suffixes, their spelling becomes immediately distinct. On your screen, you will see the category on the left with the object marker. And one of the things you'll notice is that the object marker is no longer spelled with an E-class vowel, either Sere or Segol. It's spelled with an O-class vowel, an O-class vowel, Othi, Othaka, Othak, Otho, Otha. That O-class vowel is distinctive of the definite direct object marker with a pronominal suffix. The only exception to the spelling of the definite direct object marker with the O-class vowel appears in the 2MP and the 2FP categories where you get Segol. Now let's look at the preposition eth or eth. Here you'll notice in the right column the preposition eth or eth with the type 1 pronominal suffix in every instance. Iti, itacha, itach, ito, ita. You'll notice that in each spelling the vowel under the olive is heric, and then there's a doggish forte in the tau in each instance. The vowel under the olive is heric, and then there's a doggish forte in the tau of each consonant. That spelling distinguishes the preposition from the object marker when they take pronominal suffixes. Here's how I tell my students to do it. The object marker takes the O class vowel, and the word object begins with O. All right? That's, that's the way to do it. The object marker is spelled with the O class vowel, and the English word object is spelled with O. And that's the form that takes the O class vowel. Okay? Now, the preposition does not mark the object. The preposition is a preposition, and so it's spelled with the heric and the doggish forte, completely different. So object O, the preposition is not. That's the, probably the best way to memorize the differences, otherwise you'll get confused. One form is translated simply, for example, in the 1CS, me, and the other form is translated with me. There's a big difference between me and with me, and the way you tell is not at the consonantal level. The consonants are all the same. It's the vocalization. With the O, it's the object, me. With the I, it's the preposition, with me. Okay, hang in there. We're almost done. We only have one more category to talk about before we're finished and we summarize. I want to talk about the geminate word category. Now you already know that geminate words have identical second and third root letters. But most of the time in their spelling, only one of the geminate consonants will appear in the lexical form. However, when you add something to that form, the original geminate consonant will come back as a doggish forte. Well, you already know that there are geminate nouns, but there are also geminate prepositions. Look with me at your screen. On your screen, you'll see two words in red at the top. The preposition im, meaning with, and the noun am, meaning people. The preposition im, meaning with, is a geminate preposition. It used to be spelled ion, mim, mim. The preposition am is a geminate noun. It used to be spelled ion, mim, mim. When these two words take pronominal suffixes, the original geminate consonant reappears as doggish forte in the mem, the geminate consonant. And so you'll need to be aware of that particular spelling feature. Now the preposition im and the noun am share the consonantal spelling i and mem. How do you distinguish between the two? This way. The preposition mem, the preposition im is spelled with the heric vowel under the first root letter and the noun om is spelled with the pathic under the first root letter. And that's how you distinguish the two. It's a slight spelling difference. It's not a consonantal difference. It's a vowel difference. And so if you're a native English speaker, it's tough to see those slight little dots change underneath. And that slight little change means it's not a preposition but a noun, or it's not a noun but a preposition. So this is an instance where you have to learn this material with precision in order to make sense of the language when you're reading it. All right, we're done with this chapter and I recognize this is a big chapter and there's a lot to digest. The final thing you'll see on your screen is this, a summary chart of pronominal suffixes. The type 1, the type 2, and in the middle the alternate type 1 suffixes. 
the way to master this material is one, memorize the preposition lamed with the type 1 pronominal suffixes. Then learn to recognize the alternate and type 2 suffixes in relationship to that memorized paradigm. When I quiz my students, I always have them write out the paradigm of the preposition lamed with type 1 pronominal suffixes. Once you do that, the identification of the other forms are not difficult. All right, that concludes our lecture on the pronominal suffixes. There's a lot of material in the chapter, so you may want to review before you move on to the exercises.